Absolutely, delighted to. Can everybody right. hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you have been able to join us for our program this evening. Uh, this is the second event this fall in the collaboration between Ontario Tech and the Oshawa Public Libraries in our Beyond the Walls series, in which we bring some of the ideas and the research and the work we're doing to share with you and to get your feedback and to engage in discussions about how these issues impact our everyday lives. Uh, before we get started with this evening's speaker, Stephen, um, I would like to open with a land acknowledgement. So we are thankful to be welcome on these lands in friendship. The lands we are situated on are covered by the Williams Treaties and are the traditional territory of the Mississaugas, a branch of the greater Anishinaabe Nation, including Algonquin, Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. These lands remain home to many Indigenous nations and peoples. We acknowledge this land out of respect for the Indigenous nations who have cared for Turtle Island, also called North America, from before the arrival of settler peoples until this day. Most importantly, we acknowledge that the history of these lands has been tainted by poor treatment and a lack of friendship with the First Nations who call them home. This history is something we are all affected by because we are all treaty people in Canada. We all have a shared history to reflect on and each of us is affected by this history in different ways. Our past defines our present, but if we move forward as friends and allies, then it does not have to define our future. Our plan for this evening is to turn things over to Stephen for about 20 minutes and then we have the rest of our time together for a Q&A where we can drag more information out of him and have him tell us more things. So without further ado, I am delighted to introduce my colleague, Dr. Stephen Hale. All right. Thank you very much, Andrea, and uh, and, and uh, thank you everybody for coming. And uh, and I want to thank uh, the Oshawa Life Public Library uh, for uh, helping to put together this uh, fantastic, uh, this fantastic series. I want to begin with a picture of an individual who I think is now familiar to most of us. So this is Dr. Teresa Tam. Our chairman. She is helping us deal with the current crisis that we are experiencing with respect to COVID-19. She also chairs the special advisory uh, committee epidemic of opioid overdose crisis um, committee uh, team. My apologies. And uh, the, the committee released some uh, concerning data in September of this year, data showing that for the first time in about 40 years, uh, the life expectancy, which has been gradually going up, uh, came to a halt, came to a stall. And so the numbers that they released showed that between January uh, of 2016 and 2020 um, are around 16 away from an apparent um, overdose death. Uh, and that number is about 1,018 um, just this year in January and March of 2020. Um, so the numbers are continuing to go up, which is in the wrong direction, uh, even though strategies are being implemented at the federal, provincial address this, uh, to address this issue. Um, so is this something that we can handle? Is this something that uh, can be brought under control, uh, eating uh, harms and death associated with this crisis? Um, and I think that it is. I think that like any epidemic, this is something um, that, uh, that, that, that can be addressed, but we need to look abroad and we need to look to other countries and uh, into the past. Um, to find some answers. And so I'm optimistic uh, that this is something that we can do. 
Uh, and there's a couple because we've seen similar strategies uh, employed in the past. And so one example is in the United Kingdom going back to the 1980s. And so at this period of time, uh, there was a new virus that individuals didn't know very much about at the time. Um, it was AIDS. And um, in 1985, ending of HIV and the, uh, the virus that uh, that leads to AIDS, um, the United Kingdom was noticing that um, there people who were diagnosed with AIDS and dying from AIDS uh, were relatively lower compared to other countries around the world. And so they had started to wonder if perhaps uh, they were potentially going to avoid the epidemic um, that was uh, affecting uh, places everywhere else. And so a scientist by the name of John Robertson had decided to investigate and look a little bit more because he had a sense that uh, the best way to get an understanding of how serious the epidemic was, uh, was to figure out rates of HIV diagnoses, um, something that would provide a better indication of where things might be heading in the future. Um, and so he had tested some samples amongst um, two groups, uh, an individual or a group of individuals who um, were attending a uh, clinic in Glasgow and then a group who had been using drugs. And what they found was that in Glasgow, the rate of HIV infection um, was, was zero, zero percent. Um, optimistic findings suggesting that perhaps uh, indeed the UK um, was avoiding an epidemic or avoiding numbers that were seen in other parts of the world. Uh, and then they did the exact same test in Edinburgh and found that the rate was 50 percent in terms of the number of individuals um, diagnosed or testing positive for AIDS. But this raised concern, a difference of 0% in Glasgow testing positive for HIV and then 50% testing positive for HIV uh, in, uh, in Edmund. Um, and so the concern that came from this was that there was the potential that this could then develop into a pandemic. Um, and we're living through a pandemic where we took this seriously as well. Within months, they held an emergency meeting in the House of Commons. A few months after that, uh, they decided to pilot 12 programs across the country, which were um, we refer to as uh, needle exchange programs or syringe exchange programs to attempt to prevent um, what could uh, down the road. So syringe exchange programs are places where individuals can obtain free sterile needles uh, in exchange for returning their previously one exchange. Um, and the reason why the government decided to pilot this was based on advice coming from the very doctor who had tested um, and, and generated the numbers in Glasgow and Embro. Um, what this doctor had concluded was that there was something very different going on in, in both of these cities. Um, in Glasgow, were the rate of HIV infection uh, among those who were using drugs access um, to, to new sterile syringes. You could buy them um, at a low cost in pharmacies. Um, and if police officers found you in possession, um, they didn't take them away. Whereas in Embro, the exact opposite uh, was the case. If police officers found you in possession of sterile syringes, then not only would they take them away, um, but you could potentially arrest. And in pharmacies, you couldn't get uh, these syringes. And so it became fairly clear um, to the researchers here that, that the factor that was uh, helping to keep rates extreme non-existent um, was easy access um, and low cost access to sterile syringes. Um, and so within four or five years after that, about 250,000 pounds had been invested into establishing these needle exchange programs. When they found out that they were relatively successful um, and were not causing any increase in crime, they, uh, six, um, there were over 300 syringe exchange programs operating across the country, um, costing about 238 million pounds. Um, and at that point, the British government had declared um, that, the, uh, that the crisis had been largely averted. And to this day, rates of HIV infection remain about eight times lower in the UK. Than they do here. Uh, and they largely attribute it to this program.
Um, so this is one example. Um, another example of HIV infection in Europe. Um, and roughly 1% of those uh, in uh, Portugal um, were, were struggling with opioid dependence of some form. Um, it was a country where most people knew somebody who was impacted in the Portuguese government decided to do something bold. Um, they decided to, to criminalize the possession of, of all drugs and a possession of all drugs of up to about 10 days worth. Um, but a year after that, um, and this uh, graph is thanks to, um, or uh, compliments to the Beckley Foundation, um, what we see is a very gr gradual but significant decline in the rate of HIV and AIDS among people who use drugs. But what was more striking than this was that we have opioid overdose deaths within one year after the decision to decriminalize drugs. And so the question is, what, what was the secret? Why is it that this strategy worked so well in Portugal? And I want to come back to that question in a bit, but for now, um, just that, that, um, Canada, we're doing things that are working as well, but I think that there are lessons that we can learn from abroad to help us understand why they're not, um, that uh, we're necessarily hoping for. Um, and so one place that we can look is supervised consumption facilities. And so supervised consumption facilities are one example where I think um, the numbers don't lie with respect to uh, the number of individuals and the number of lives who have been saved. And so why is that? Well, supervised injection or individual are places where individuals can bring drugs that have been illegally purchased uh, in order to consume them under medical supervision with sterile um, needles that have been provided by this facility. Um, so to be clear here, these are places where people bring um, drugs that have been illegally purchased. And so these are drugs where um, um, the extent to which they might be um, they might be contaminated with fentanyl and other very dangerous uh, substances um, are things that unless there's facilities uh, or uh, technology at these places to allow for testing, um, it's often unknown. And so as a result of that, um, there are dangers associated with these, uh, with the use of these drugs. And indeed, um, people do overdose at these facilities. In fact, in any given year, there, there's hundreds of individuals who will accidentally overdose consuming drugs in numbers. Uh, don't lie with respect to the effectiveness is, is that uh, although we see hundreds of overdoses taking place at consumption, um, we don't have a single case of an individual who has died um, as a result of an overdose. Um, so since the first facility in sight, not a single person has died. Um, so the effects are quite, um, are, are quite striking with respect to the numbers, the thousands of individuals whose lives have been saved um, by, by attending these supervised uh, consumption facilities. Um, and so we've seen thousands of lives saved, um, but in terms of address, um, increasing number of overdose um, they, they don't appear to be bringing um, to open enough and establish enough supervised consumption facilities across the country. Um, and so we need to remember the lesson that we learned from the United Kingdom when faced with um, what was perceived to be an emergency crisis in the 1980s, the government acted quickly. They invested millions of pounds within a matter of months and they opened hundreds of needle exchange programs um, within a few years. And my worry is that we did back in the 1980s. So while the UK, OP90 here in Canada, we had only opened about 35 um, similar programs. And so today, uh, at present, we have 39 supervised consumption facilities operating across the country. Um, and that number on the face of the graphically distributed 
the vast majority of those 39 facilities are located um, in just a handful of provinces across Canada, Ontario, British Columbia, Alberta, uh, Quebec, Saskatchewan's on the list, but there's only one consumption facility there. Uh, and it means that the entire Atlantic region of Canada doesn't have a single supervised consumption facility. Um, and an area and region that I'm worried about the most is the Northern Territories, where again, there are no supervised concurrently. Um, and also, um, we're talking about a region of the country with overdose death with respect to uh, opioids. Um, so, so we need to open more supervised consumption facilities um, in more parts of Canada. Uh, and when we do look at the provinces where we do have supervised consumption facilities, um, also largely concentrated um, in some of the largest cities in particular. So we have facilities in Toronto, for example, in Ontario or in Montreal and Quebec, but then there's large that we know save hundreds of lives on a yearly basis. Um, Oshawa is an example of a city that doesn't yet have a supervised consumption facility. Um, and yet at the beginning of September, there was a period of, of 36 hours in which there were 11 calls for emergency services um, related to uh, opioid overdoses and, and one person, uh, tra the mayor of Oshawa, Dan Carter, said that we, we need to do everything we possibly can um, to address this epidemic and, and we have to remember that that um, this was something that he had personally experienced when um, he saw somebody overdosing in uh, a public um, parking garage uh, about a year ago and so he says that we need to do everything we can to address um, the crisis has to include the establishment of more supervised consumption facilities based on what we know in terms of its impact. Um, and, and yes, we, we need multiple facilities. A city like Oshawa needs more than one facility. Let's go back to Vancouver, Insight 2003. Um, on any given day, uh, outside of the uh, facility, uh, because there's only a certain number of um, spots within the facility for people to be um, safely consuming. Um, so you have the people waiting on any given day, um, but of course, this has gotten worse as a result of the pandemic. Um, with physical distancing and other me measures, you can't have as many people inside of these facilities, which means Lot more people outside waiting to get inside, trying to physically distance, waiting for long hours. Um, and it's not that Vancouver doesn't have more facilities, they do, but, but in order to get to these other facilities, it would involve having to make quite a trek um, by transit, uh, which can be a very many facilities. Um, think about opening more facilities within these cities, recognizing that rural areas across Canada are particularly in need as well. Um, and to look to countries abroad, to think innovatively and creatively about where all the possible places can be that these facilities can open, um, establishing injection and community centers um, and prisons. That's a lesson that we learned particularly from um, operating uh, supervised consumption facilities within prisons um, for uh, almost uh, a couple of, with almost a couple of decades. Difficulties with the sound. I feel like it's uh, it's uh, it, it's cutting in and out. Did anybody want me to stop for a second or? Hi, Stephen. It's Allison. Can you hear me? Should I stop? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Now you are cutting in and out for me, at least. Yes, I can hear you. Are you having trouble hearing me? You keep cutting in and out a bit. I can um, hear you just. All right. I think, yeah, you're cutting. I think the sound's cutting in and out for me as well, unfortunately. I was wondering, you mentioned about uh, rural um, sites. Mm -hmm. Are you able to talk a little bit more about the rural, um, any rural sites? 
uh, in terms of um, any rural sites that are presently uh, presently in operation or um, the needs? Do you, I guess more if you have any examples of any um, in rural locations. In rural location, I mean, by and large, the major, all of the facilities that are operating right now would be, I, I would, I would classify them to be in uh, in more urban areas, more urban centers. So, um, so like as, as we're looking at province like Ontario, um, where we see supervised consumption facilities would be Toronto, um, well, certainly, but St. Catharines, Kitchener, you know, larger larger cities, but but not um, areas that I would think of as being uh, more as being more uh, rural. There's certainly a divide in which across all of our provinces. We see is clearly larger urban cities, the larger urban centers, um, the larger cities, and uh, and the rural areas are largely being excluded. Which which again is particularly concerning, especially when we're getting in areas. Um, Sudbury is an example. We do have some you know northern um, examples of consumption facilities that have been operating for a while, but but again these are the cities. These aren't um, the, the, and there are no locations in more rural areas um, and, and and we could say something similar for syringe exchange programs well there are more um, again a product so does that help does that answer your, your question yeah that, that that's I, I sort of thought that they were mostly uh, in urban areas yeah. but I was curious because you did mention um, that there was a need for them in rural which is what I've understand is that there is this need so thank you there's a need for these facilities everywhere in the same way that there's a need for syringe exchange programs everywhere. And again, a lesson that we can learn from the UK is that, you know, with over 300 facilities operating across the country, they're, um, they're in every area um, of the city. They're in rural parts of the country. They're in uh, urban centers, but also smaller cities and towns as well um, because of the extent to which they've been rolled out. Um, how's the sound? Am I able to like keep going or continue? Hi, Stephen. This is Aziz. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It, absolutely. Like the voice on my side is a little bit choppy, but I, uh, I'm not sure okay. about the, the attendees, so. I saw go ahead. Jennifer said to please go ahead, but yeah, I want to make sure from the other attendees um, if it's okay to continue along. Um, and I'll be happy if there's any other questions, I'll be happy to. Um, I've got um, one, an individual asking, how do we overcome stigma within these neighborhoods? And that's an excellent question. And if it's okay, if I can hold off on answering that, um, I did, that is something that I do want to uh, touch on towards the end because I think stigma, I agree, is such. Uh, an important part of this, uh, an important part of the equation. Um, this is a country where we see supervised consumption facilities operating in uh, within prisons as well. Um, again, areas where um, oh, I see somebody saying that the the voice is very choppy on there, and apologies. Um, I'll stop for a second and ask if uh, to take a break. I know Carol's saying as well that it's choppy on their end. Stephen, I think just continue and yep. uh, yeah. All right, perfect. You're in the middle of your presentation, uh, just continue, please. Thank you. Okay, all right. And, um, Another thing that's interesting and important to look at Switzerland is uh, that on top of uh, 
on, on top of establishing supervised consumption facilities within prisons, um, this is also a place where we saw advances with respect to um, not just supervised consumption, um, but all provides consumption of heroin that is being provided to individuals um, who need it. Uh, and so another term for this or a term that we've been using more and more and seeing more and more in the Canadian context uh, is this idea of safe supply or safer supply. Um, provision of, of, of heroin, um, which we would call diacetyl morphine. Um, and diacetyl morphine is uh, the scientific term or medical term for, for medical grade heroin. So in other words, heroin that has been by the government um, that we know is pure in quality, um, that we know what its dosage is, uh, and therefore can be prescribed or can be provided safely um, to, uh, to individuals uh, to individuals who need it. Um, and so if we go to Switzerland, we see in the 1990s, in 1994 in particular, um, what was called the Swiss Opiate Trials. Uh, and so the Swiss Opiate Trials, which took place, um, involved two groups. Um, one group of individuals, um, which we know is pure, doesn't have anything in it uh, that's going to be uh, dangerous, um, and that we know the dosage of, and so that we can control the dosage when it's being provided to somebody. And so 250 people received uh, this medical grade heroin, whereas another group of 250 individuals received methadone, um, which we would substitute uh, something that uh, is part of the same family of uh, substances, um, but is not the same as heroin, and therefore the effects can be different. Receiving methadone uh, instead of uh, heroin, it can be helpful with respect to treatment. For, for others, um, it, it, it's not as uh, helpful as they would like. Um, and so they provided heroin to one group of 250 individuals, and they provided methadone uh, to another group and individuals or the group that received heroin as opposed to methadone um, experienced um, lower rates of uh, crime and criminal recidivism, higher rates of employment, uh, improved well-being. Um, but on top of all of these things, the most striking findings was that among the group that received heroin and that were received heroin as part of these clinical trials, um, they experienced um, the they, uh, lower rates um, and, and less use of heroin over time in the group uh, receiving um, heroin um, who um, succeeded in, in being able to abstain, abstain long term compared to those who were receiving methadone. Um, and, so, uh, and so it's these results that, that put um, the provision of Diacetylmorphine, including um, including um, agonists and opioid antagonists, uh, as well as uh, cognitive therapy, residential treatment programs. Um, the, the provision of diacetylmorphine is one of the most successful programs, and um, those that took part in the study and those that that were um, were behind the study argued that it was largely because. Uh, there were relatively few controls in terms of how much um, heroin someone could receive. Um, it would, um, or there wasn't any uh, attempt to necessarily be, be prescribing less dosages. It was largely up to the individuals involved in the program. And so they argued that for the first time for many people, um, they felt relatively secure uh, in their access to heroin. And this relative security led to um, increased um, emotional and mental well-being being regular uh, access to, to heroin, um, less costly than it would be under other circumstances, um, and feeling in a more stable position uh, and, and safe 
moving towards um, using less heroin and moving towards abstinence. Uh, and so we've carried out a similar study here in Canada called um, NAOMI, which is an acronym for the North American um, Opioid Maintenance Initiative. So the only one of its kind in North America, and it's produced similar results um, where those who received heroin use of drugs of 68% compared to only 48% for those who were taking methadone. And so on, again, the numbers don't lie with respect to the uh, strong advocacy of these programs. Uh, but one of the differences is that while in Switzerland, when the numbers came out that showed these positive results, they then rolled these programs across the entire country. Um, here in Canada at present, we still only have the entire country um, in which you can receive prescribed heroin. Uh, and so once again, um, we need to expand access uh, to these programs. Um, but when it's expanding access, I think we also need to think um, innovatively about uh, how to ensure that that access is reliable. Because again, what's one of the things that we've learned um, with the experience of the pandemic in uh, March, while, while pharmacies largely stayed open, Open, and while supervised consumption facilities were able to stay open, um, clinics had to close shut down. Uh, so what do you do in situations like this? How are we able to get um, some experimentation with uh, various strategies? Like, for example, um, home delivery of substitutes such as methadone. Um, so a question I have is, is can we do something similar with heroin, for example. Um, in uh, a facility in downtown, Maine, much like an ATM, in which you enter in a key and a password and you can receive um, a dosage of an opioid substitute such as methadone. And so again, is there something that we could do similarly with heroin in a controlled setting? Uh, in other countries around the world, these opioid substitutes are widely available in pharmacies. Can we do the same thing with respect to heroin? It would result in unsupervised consumption of uh, these substances. But again, learning from examples around the world and looking at what's been done around the world, what we see is that there are other places that have had um, long-standing policies with respect to uh, heroin prescription. And once again, Britain is an example of a country. One when they initially passed their, their first law prohibiting heroin, about six years later, um, a committee by the name of the Ralston Committee um, concluded in their commitment that doctors should be allowed uh, and able to prescribe heroin um, to, uh, to certain patients um, on an ongoing permanent basis. Uh, and so this became a system, it became known as the British system that operated for 40 years and continues to operate to a certain an extent there as well. Um, and so there's lessons to learn there, money and investment um, and political will, um, which, uh, which unfortunately, when we've only got two heroin assisted therapy clinics um, and 39 supervised consumption, um, it's clear that more needs to be done. Um, and I think that a lot of this comes down to a question of political will. And anything else, if there was anything else going on that was causing tens of thousands of individuals to accidentally die, um, like what we're seeing with the opioid, um, over funneling um, money into these initiatives and, and rolling out and expanding these initiatives as much as possible. Um, but we're talking about illegal substances like heroin, um, drug centric. I have been involved in, in a war on drugs, and so the stigma and the labeling associated with them, um, I think, are, are a hindrance. Uh, and so decriminalization and the importance, I think, um, with, um, and I think one of the things uh, that led to uh, the success in Portugal with the numbers going down is the fact that um, decriminalization helped the accelerate a process of changing attitudes 
um, are you know, there's lessons that we can learn there and bring here. And I'm not necessarily advocating for doing decriminalization exactly the same way as it's been done in uh, Portugal. Um, one of the things they require is that if somebody is found in possession of drugs is that they have to appear before a committee of individuals um, that might require we do have a bill on the floor it's a private members bill currently um so, so it's not likely going to pass parliament um but if uh, Erka and smith but what he's proposing is that we remove um criminal we remove legislation um prohibiting uh possession of all drugs completely out of the controlled drugs and substances act um a question i asked though is, is, is can we go one step further uh, a program in the united states known as lead um, allows for um, for the purposes of possession, but even for selling drugs, if, if it's selling drugs on, on a small scale, um, which we know from research is most likely being done um, to help support family and help support themselves. Um, so can we take this bill and can we move it one step further? Uh, and so in conclusion, that once again, uh, he's looking abroad. He's looking to lessons um, from other countries. Um, he says that what we find around the world is that with decriminalization, um, access to tree increases that we can learn there. Um, but also a question um, that I'm happy to hear people say, and that is if you look closely at the legislation that he's proposing, um, it's asking to take um, the criminalization of um, drug possession completely out of the control, um, but it's not being replaced with any other um, scheme. In other words, it's not um, being um, reclassified as an administrative uh, offense, for example. And so I wonder if that's the case, are we really talking about decriminalization or are we perhaps talking about the legalization of drug possession? Uh, with respect to um, tackling the opioid academic, uh, epidemic here in Canada. Um, but thank you very much, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Fantastic, Stephen. Thank you so much. And I'm Great, sure thank you. we will all have questions, especially to fill in some of the gaps of the, the tech issues that got in the way of us hearing everything yeah. as clearly as I know we would have liked. Um, I would love to turn things over to those of you that have joined us. So if you've got a question, please feel free to put it in the chat um, or just let us know in the chat that you have one and we can unmute you and you can ask it yourself, whatever is most, most feasible for you. There was that, uh, so Jen Clark here with the library, there yeah. was that question earlier about reducing the uh, stigma within neighborhoods. Mm -hmm, absolutely. I'm just going to go back and see if I can find uh, and find the question. How do we overcome the stigma within neighborhoods? And I think that's a great question. Um, I think that uh, part, there's, there's, there's a number of ways in, in which that, um, you know, I think there's, there's a number of ways in which it, it, it can be done. But I think that the lesson that we learned from Portugal is that um, perhaps one of the most effective ways to accelerate that, um, that, that reduction in stigma is through decriminalization. The decriminalization of, uh, of possession of drugs and perhaps even decriminalization of uh, possession, um, whether it's for personal consumption or for sale, um, that what we've learned from other countries is that with that decriminalization um, comes uh, a, a changing in the, uh, the way in which um, drugs is framed, the way in which it is socially constructed, um, because you're taking the, the criminal label um, away, you're literally, you're, you're decriminalizing. And so by doing that, um, um, reconstructing it from 
um, what is a, uh, you know, what is seen for predominantly as, as a crime related pro, pro problem to a uh, public, uh, um, to a public health problem. And so I think that it's, um, it's reducing the stigma, I increasing awareness, there's a lot that's, um, that's not known about um, these about about um, substances and uh, uh, substance dependence um, factors uh, that are related to it. And so, so I think in campaigns, and we've seen um, how uh, public awareness has been has been used um, in the past, but but it's often used in a way that's um, largely rooted in, in in fear, creating fear around these uh, um, illicit substances, fear around those who sell them, um, misinformation and, and information that's not entirely factual. And, and so I think that um, we need to use similar challenge or similar channels or similar mechanisms, um, whether it's public education, television, school, to, 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 to reframe and, and, and send, um, you know, and, and, and send a more accurate and more realistic uh, and holistic, um, you know, perspective to uh, or um, account of um, the, the reality of um, dependence and, uh, and, and the use of illicit uh, historical and puts it into a larger context. So I see a question here. Is it uh, is it okay if I go to the next question? Or all right. So how large of a difference is the rate of opioid overdose in uh, places like the United Kingdom compared to places like Canada? Um, and could this be a reason for why there are not as many supervised consumption facilities? So so that's it. An, and um, and the rate of um, why well. I, well um, I don't have the exact numbers. What, what we do know is that the, the, the rate is considerably higher um, here in Canada, um, in, in North America in general, Canada and the United States, considerably higher here um, than it is in uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, Portugal, uh, high numbers at the uh, the end of the 1990s, heading into the early 20th century. But then as you saw with that graph, that the number goes down um, very rapidly um, within, a first, within two or three years after um, within two or three years after decriminalization, so so there there are there are variations, there are differences around the world for for uh, for a number of reasons. Um, it could help to explain why why compared to here, and it's interesting because the United Kingdom. Um, has, has such a history in terms of being a, a, a trailblazer with uh, things like um, syringe exchange programs, um, which I mentioned, or, or heroin prescription. Um, but with supervised consumption facility, facilities, it's, it's the opposite. Um, here in Canada, we've, we've established and opened um, um, quite a few more than, uh, than in the UK, and it's taken a little bit longer, um, and it's taken a little bit longer in, uh, in the United Kingdom. And so, and so, you know, certainly those kind of factors can, um, you know, certainly those kind of factors uh, can, can, you know, can help. But at the end of the day, it's quite often sort of the perception of what um, the rates are rather than, um, than, than, than the reality. So, um, it, you know, the numbers are, uh, although they are lower, uh, they don't necessarily fully explain why, for example, in, in the early 2000s, when there was more of a similarity in rates of overdose, why, why we started moving towards establishing supervised consumption facilities and um, and they didn't. So, um, and Carol's asked, are there trends with different groups or, um, or, or, or cultures, do you know? Uh, this is one of the things where the, you know, the best available evidence in the States uh, as well as here in Canada, although we, we, we need to collect more. And one of the things is that we, we do need to collect more data and learn more in the Canadian context. Um, is that uh, is that that rates are rates are relatively equal across groups across some um, we certainly see uh, differences in um, from from province to province region to to, to region um, you know those who are disadvantaged um, there can be uh, different but 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 across the range this is a problem that that affects and impacts um, 
everybody, uh, regardless of culture or race or ethnicity, and important things that, that so often um, part of the stigma associated with the use of these substances and what has led to the criminalization of so many of these substances is um, is is a is a is a perception that they're associated with particular groups um, and particular um, often uh, racialized individuals racialized groups, those who are being uh, being targeted um, and those who are being perceived as a threat. Um, the criminalization of these, these different drugs take place. Um, it's not because of concerns about the harms associated with these drugs, but rather who it is that's being perceived as, as, as using these drugs. So crack cocaine, for example, um, with uh, those within the African-American community uh, in the, uh, the, the 1980s and, uh, and other groups. Um, but, but in terms of objective data, um, the, the problem is uh, one that affects all individuals and, and all groups, unfortunately. Stephen, it's, it's Jennifer from the library. Yes. Um, do you know, yes, so, yes. so Toronto being a very, very large um, urban area, um, does Toronto have a supervised consumption site? I know a couple of years ago, Oshawa, there was a bid um, yep. from Lake Ridge Health uh, and um, I believe Pinewood at the time, as well as some other uh, supporting organizations that put in a bid for a supervised consumption site for this area. So mm -hmm. if, if people are struggling and they are looking for a supervised consumption site, um, you commented that there's only 39 in Canada in total. Um, so That's where right. where yeah. do people go? That's that's a good question. It, I, I, I mean, people go so you, so to to answer your question. Yeah, there are, and I can't um, you know I can't recall offhand how many are uh, are in Toronto at the moment. But um, but there are uh, a number of facilities, and and some of them are. Um, are, are, are run by the federal government, and so their uh, supervised consumption facilities them um, were were funded by the were funded by the provincial government. They work a little bit differently and have different uh, procedures behind them. But um, but 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 there are a number of um, of uh, facilities in Toronto. So there's one, for example, um, relatively close to the uh, Young and Dundas area. But there's also one in uh, in uh, um, the uh, the the west part of uh, uh of king street uh but the number is still about six or seven for a city the size of um toronto that are far they um where do they go they have to um go to the nearest facility which might not be which might not be uh close and and, and for many outside of toronto if we're talking about oshawa for example in particular um then then in most cases the reality is the option is that there there isn't necessarily uh, a place to, to go. Um, for some, being able to travel into Toronto might be a possibility, but for, but for many, that, that's extremely that, that's extremely difficult. Um, so, so where do you go if a supervised consumption facility is part of the problem? In many of these cases, individuals then um, they uh, they might use with or they might uh, consume with uh, with others. Um, but in a lot of instances, um, individuals are they're they're in um, these uh, uh, substances by themselves alone um, and it could be in places where um, because they're worried about the stigma and possibility of arrest um, it's going to be in um, places like parks uh, alleyways public washrooms facilities where if somebody accidentally overdoses um, the possibility of somebody being close by and able to to intervene quickly um, to be able to revive them using the lock zone, for example, which is a somebody. Um, if someone can get to you quickly, then um, then then there's 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 good chances that uh, somebody can be revived and they'll be fine. But if they can't get to somebody quickly enough, 
um, then um, then that's when these uh, overdoses often turn into uh, into fatalities. Um, so it, it really varies from person to person, and and sometimes we hear about you know places that are uh, that are that are not sanctioned or are unofficial um, that 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 uh, people can go to, but it'd be risk, especially if there is concern that uh, the police officers are going to be going to be close by and so and so in so many of these circumstances if the consumption facility is not nearby if it's not available then then people will often use alone and will use in in places that um where where somebody isn't going to find and that's and that's the concern and that's why you know these facilities which we know are effective and we know people say that's why more facilities need to be uh need to be available but again it needs to be tied with um, with with a decriminalization that can help shift attitudes um, around the use of drugs because um, because that can help facilities as well. More people, let's say Oshawa does open a supervised consumption facility, um, more people will be willing to to go to these facilities, and there will be more um, you know interest and uh, and will and level of the government to to fund and establish more of these. Um, I think. Um, if there's a shift in these uh, attitudes and re reduction of that stigma through something like decriminalization, um, but does that does does that answer your your, your question? It does. Um, there's another question from mm -hmm. Car Carol, who yes. supervises the centers, a nurse. Yeah, and normal a normally a nurse. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. normally a nurse. Uh, in some case, in the majority of situations, it's, it's a nurse, but someone with medical, you know, someone with medical experience, someone who is, is experienced and knows how to um, intervene quickly uh, and, 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 and has access, has naloxone and uh, can use naloxone quickly to revive somebody. And that's, that's what makes these facilities um, so incredibly effective um, for individuals who, who are on site is that um, there's somebody there who is, is watching at all times within seconds, within seconds of somebody experiencing an overdose, um, they, can, um, they, they can intervene and, and, and do all the right steps. But, but yes, it would be a nurse or someone with um, medical experience. Stephen, hi. Yes. I was wondering if you could say a bit more about some of the obstacles or challenges to, to dealing with these issues in more rural centers compared to urban centers. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's, a, that's a good question. In, in, in more rural centers, oh, I, 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 think, I think part of the issue is, is, is a perception that's often, that, 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 that is quite often not true, that, um, that these are areas that, that don't require uh, supervised uh, consumption facilities. So a notion, and, and we see this in rural centers, we also see this in certain regions or areas across Canada too, like the, like the Atlantic regions. Um, where there's a, where there's a perception that um, that this is not a problem experienced in these areas that this is this is something that happens in uh, in urban centers in larger cities like uh, like 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 Toronto or Vancouver um, not in rural areas and so and so that can often be an obstacle um, one of the reasons why Toronto why there was so much um, opposition in Toronto for years was this perception that that um, that, that the use of opiates wasn't a problem in Toronto and that uh, changed us. So, so I think that's that's part of it. Is in rural areas, this uh, a sense that um, that this is uh, you know that that while people are are certainly um, um, that while, while there's certainly people struggling, uh, that uh, when it comes to opioid overdose deaths, that that that's not something that's happening. Uh, so, so I think that that's one of the uh, one of the obstacles. Um, one of the obstacles, certainly, um, sometimes not as much uh, familiarity with uh, these facilities. Uh, but in general, what we also often see is that in terms of uh, opposition to or, or obstacles to to establishing these facilities, there there's certain groups um, that that really help or that can really help facilitate get um, getting, say, for example, a, a city, a, a city council, for example, or a town council 
necessity include things like like hearing from support from from police officers. So if you have a police chief who's supportive, then that can go um, a big step uh, of the way. Uh, if you have support from uh, from um, people around a government table, that can help too. Um, but quite often, um, communities in these areas they, they they often need to be convinced that that a large number of people in these communities will support these facilities. And so sometimes one of the obstacles is just not having any data or not having or not knowing to what extent there is support. Um, and so surveys need to be carried out. Often one of the key steps moving towards the establishment of a facility is carrying out a public opinion survey. And when, when a survey comes back and you then find out that you know what the vast majority of people support. And, and most of the time, that's what we see. When a survey is carried out, before the surveys are carried out, there's often assumptions that 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 you know there's going to be mostly opposition. Most people aren't going to like this idea. This would be politically um, unsafe if you're uh, a politician voting on something. But, but most of the time, what we find is that when surveys Surveys are carried out, you know, good rigorous surveys um, and and um, focus group meetings um, within these communities that um, that the majority of people are on side. And, and so when political, when leaders in these areas know that the majority of people in these communities um, are, are on side, then um, then they're more comfortable moving to back these. And so I think that's that's an obstacle, perhaps in particular, is that we, we don't have a lot of data, particularly in rural areas, um, and we need to reach out. This kind of outreach and um, and soliciting of uh, and feedback and information needs to be needs to be carried out. That does that answer your question? Yeah. It does absolutely. Okay. And thank you so much. I wanted to take advantage of this, this summation of yours to thank you again um, for joining us, Stephen. And thank you to our guests for your fantastic questions that help us get into this issue in more detail. Um, Jen, I believe the Oshawa Public Library will have some resources up for people to follow through if they want more information, to learn more about these kinds of things, yes? Yes, absolutely. Um, if you like, I can take just about a minute yeah. here and share my screen with you. So here we have some uh, items that are available now at the Oshawa Public Library. Overdose is an astonishing and powerful look at the ongoing opioid crisis, the only book of its kind in Canada. Perrin is a law and policy expert in Vancouver and challenges many assumptions about the people who use opioids. Why do people use fentanyl? Where does it come from and why can't we stop it? Overcoming opioid addiction is an evidence-based guide for people who live with the addiction and can also be used by those who work with or are friends of addicts. It also goes into detail regarding the uniqueness of opioid addiction and why it is more difficult to treat than other forms of substance abuse. From his perspective as an addiction physician working on the front lines of the epidemic, Dr. Raman discusses the disease and the cure in the age of fentanyl. It brings the hopeful message that a coalition of patients, advocates, scientists, doctors, and nurses are finding solutions and making plans to stem the overdose deaths, block the spread of fentanyl, and end the epidemic. Dope Sick is journalist Beth Macy's chronicle of the epidemic in the United States. It traces how the crisis began in the 90s and explores how that microcosm of addiction ballooned into something much more dangerous and wide sweeping. Dope Sick was also made into a TV series slated to be released next year on Hulu, I believe. If you prefer to watch instead of read, then I recommend Op Opioids Inc. and Understanding the Opioid Epidemic. They're both PBS documentaries that examine how the epidemic began, continues to exist, and the role that the drug companies play in it. Time Bomb is a CBC doc from the Fifth Estate that explores the devastating effects of being addicted to Oxycontin, the opioid that started it all. For all these and more, I believe Stephen might be sharing some resources with us as well after, then you yeah. just need to visit Absolutely. our website. Yeah, just visit uh, oshlib.ca. Thank you. Fantastic. Great, um, that's fantastic. And before we wrap up for the evening, I would like to thank you all again. And I would like to slightly selfishly remind you of our next installment 
in two weeks on December 14th. And it is slightly selfish because I will be making the change uh, from host to speaker. So if you are interested in learning more about Hallmark movies, just in time for the Hallmark holidays, I'll be talking about Hallmark films and the role they play in Canada's film industry. So thank you again, everyone, so much for joining us. It was wonderful to have you. And we look forward to you joining us again soon. Bye, thank you. Great, thank you very much again. Take care. Good night, everybody. Thank you so and much. Great thank timing you. on your upcoming talk. Good night. Good night, everybody.